welcome back to the Blue Ridge Wildlife Center. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, today we have a very special guest. Uh, I am not going to be doing the presentation today. I'm actually going to be the cameraman. So in a couple minutes, I'm going to or in a minute, I'm going to introduce our, our guest speaker for today, and then I'm going to be in charge of questions, which will be fun. Uh, today we are talking about vultures, specifically uh, a vulture named Vega, and I'm going to actually turn things over now to her uh, handler. Uh, Heather Shanks Gibbons, who's also one of our volunteers and has been taking care of Vega for almost a year now. Almost a year now. All right, so thank you guys so much. Enjoy. Uh, and if you have questions, remember, please feel free to ask them. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Heather, um, and um, I am one of the volunteers at Blue Ridge. I've been volunteering in wildlife rehab for about uh, almost three years now. And also, I started, actually about two years ago, started to get involved with caring for non-releasable vultures. Um, and so as, as Jen said, I've had Vega now for almost a year. We've been working together since she came in. We're going to talk a little bit about her story today, how she came to be an education ambassador. And then we're going to talk about vultures, kind of overall, how amazing they are, and some of the challenges that they face around the world. Please, as we go, as Jennifer said, ask questions. We'd love to, to respond to questions in real time. So I really want to introduce the star of the show, which is Vega. So let's see if she'll willingly come out now. Come on, Vega. Step. Step. She's a little angry because we put her back in her cage. So Vega is, as you see when she walks out, she is a turkey vulture. So we have here in Virginia, on the east coast of the US, we have two species of vultures that we see regularly. We have our turkey vulture and we have our black vulture. The turkey vulture, and I think you can start to see as her head peeks out, is the one that you see that has the red head when they're an adult. Um, their feathers are kind of a brownish black, and in the light you'll, that you'll actually see, they have kind of a beautiful bluish iridescence to their feathers. Our black vultures are the ones that you see that are really jet black with kind of whitish looking legs and grayish black heads. Um, so when you see them up close, you can see the differences. When we see the vultures soaring up in the sky, and something to always remember is when you look up and you see those really beautiful, elegant birds with the huge wings soaring, people automatically want to say, oh, that's an eagle or that's a hawk. Most likely, that's a vulture up there soaring. Um, so when you look at them from the underside, if you ever want to tell the difference between our two local species, is the turkey vulture, when they fly, one is they tend to hold their wings more in kind of a V shape, and the underside of the wings sort of has a silvery edge to it. Our black vultures, when they fly, they tend to fly a little bit flatter, and only the tips of their wings on the underside are white. So, yes? Question. Is it true when they're soaring that they're circling something dead on the ground? Not necessarily. Um, so the way vultures find food is they take advantage, because they're a large bird, they take advantage of uh, thermals or the warm air that's rising. And so a lot of the times when you see them soaring, they're actually currently looking to find food. So they're soaring high in the air. They're using a combination of sight. Um, black vultures tend to uh, find their food. They're much more visually oriented. So they're looking to find a carcass or something in the ground. Uh, turkey vultures are unique uh, in the birds in that they have a very keen sense of smell. They actually, the part of their brain that um, uh, the olfactory lobe, which is used for smell, is one of the largest of any of the bird species. So when they're soaring, not only are they looking, but they're also smelling. They can pick up very, very minute particles of a dead animal somewhere, even under a tree cover. And so they're seeking also by the sense of smell. So they may be circling over something dead. More likely, you're seeing them when they're trying to find and search out their area to find something to eat. Nick, are you ever going to come out here? Step. Step. She's not usually shy, so let's see if they're going to come out. Step up. So, anyhow, so a little bit about, let me just tell you a little bit about Vega's story. So, Vega actually came into the Blue Ridge Wildlife Center. Do we have another? Let's do one. Oh, yeah, yeah, please. You can pull up the, uh, the image. She came into the Blue Ridge Wildlife Center last spring, um, or last, the end of last winter, last spring. Um, and the thing that's unique about her is, and one of the reasons she's a great uh, ambassador, is she kind of experienced everything that can happen to a bird in terms of the things that we see as challenges for our vultures. So she came into the Wildlife Center with gunshot wounds. She was illegally shot. Um, and an important thing to know is in our area, it is illegal to shoot our vultures or other raptors. Um, under our Migratory Bird Act, um, they're all protected. So she was illegally shot for some unknown reason. Um, and what we did up here is I put a picture of her x-rays. 
So when she came in, she had about, I think it was between 14 and 17 pellets um, scattered throughout her body. Um, with that gunshot wound, it had broken her wing, so she actually had her, her wing pinned and um, had to heal. She also had, um, one of the pellets is actually and continues to be lodged in her brain. It was so close in her head that we couldn't remove it. Um, and because of that, it actually injured one of her eyes and she had to have an eye removed. On top of that, um, she also faced one of the other key problems that our vultures and other raptors um, in our area suffer, which is she ate something that was hunted that had lead shot in it, and this is Vega, um, and so she had lead poisoning and lead toxicity. And then on top of everything else, um, with all those other injuries and, and things causing her to be ill, she consumed something that was not natural, it blocked her GI tract, and she had to have it surgically removed. So this bird, had pretty much gone through everything a vulture could possibly go through. There you go. And you see she's very playful, very interested. Let me see if I can get her to step up so we can get a better look at her. Good girl. So she had about half the pellets removed out of her body, um, but like I said, a couple of them still remain, particularly the one in her skull, which gives her a few problems with her balance. Um, so the reason she couldn't ultimately be released back to the wild after all these surgeries is a combination of the fact that with only one eye, her vision is impaired, so she can't really have good depth perception. She can only fly short distances, so she couldn't do the beautiful soaring in the sky to find food. She can only fly short areas. Um, and with her balance problems, it just gave her a whole range of things that could not let her be released back to the wild. But we're very lucky in the fact that she has a very easy temperament, and she makes a great ambassador. She loves to go out and meet people and show how amazing vultures are. Um, you can see here, I have little bumpers on her wings. She doesn't have like problem injuries there, but because of her balances, you see she sometimes bumps into things. And so we don't want her to get wounds on her wrists from banging into things. So in her, in her enclosures, I keep her with some bandages on. So that's the Vegas story. So let's just talk a little bit about why vultures are so amazing. So I want to touch on that, and then I want to touch on some of the challenges our vultures face, not just here in the United States, but around the world. So vultures are incredible, and most people hear this, vultures are awesome, um, because they have an amazing role in our ecosystem. They are a premier scavenger, and their whole job is to go into the environment and remove dead and decaying animals and things from the environment. So it's a very kind of gross role in some ways, but it's also a very, very critical role, because not only does it remove dead and decaying animal matter from the environment, which could potentially contaminate our waters, it could be a source for disease, um, but they're recycling those nutrients and bringing them back into the environment. So they're basically recycling the dead and giving it a new opportunity for life. Um, so they really have an amazing role. They're also very uniquely adapted for this role. And so if you can see with her, vultures have some different characteristics that make them so perfect for the job that they do. So you can see with Vega here, she has this incredibly sharp and pointy beak. They use that obviously for being able to tear into things. But what you can see with Vega, if the light hits right, is she has this very large opening where her nose is. You can sometimes see right through it. And that narrow to that opening allows her, like I said, when she's soaring up in the sky, to be able to detect tiny, tiny molecules of um, scent from a decaying animal. That gives her that advantage of really being able to pick up that scent when she's flying. You can also see, if you can, vultures have incredibly large, sharp talons. But their feet, particularly the vultures we see here in what we call the New World, or the vultures in the Americas, their feet, though, are relatively flat. So unlike what you might think with a, a hawk or an eagle, which have very powerful grasping feet, their feet aren't used to grasp prey. All they really need to do is walk around and get to a carcass, a dead animal, and they use their feet then for, to help them brace while they tear and remove parts from that animal. So their feet are flat, mostly for walking, um, but the, yeah, the claws are there, or the nails are there, which allow them to hold on when they're feeding. Some of the other incredible things is, as we see, um, many, many, most vultures have relatively bald heads. Now, she's a relatively young vulture. She's only about two, two and a half years old. So she still has a lot of what we call baby fuzz on her head. Eventually, as she gets older, a lot more of that hair will go, and she will end up with a much balder head. But many vulture species have that hairless or bald head, which gives them that advantage if they're sticking their head into a rotting carcass and bringing it out, they're not getting a bunch of 
blood and gore stuck to their feathers, which could be a point of contamination later on. Another thing, and what's kind of really the most amazing adaptation, is their digestive tract. So people always wonder, how can they go out and eat a rotting carcass and not get sick? If we do that, we would be, we'd be done. Um, but their GI tract, their stomach acid, is incredibly, incredibly acidic. So they're able to digest things like rabies, um, cholera, botulism, those kind of bacteria. If it's in the meat that they eat, it's actually destroyed when it goes through the, the GI tract. So there's very few bacterial agents and so forth that can affect our vultures, which is a really, really cool feature. So, let's see, any other great adaptations we want to talk about? Well, we talked about her wings, and I, unfortunately she may not open her wings up for us, she might show us. But as I mentioned, you know, the, when they soar, that was an energy, conser uh, energy conservation um, adaptation of the vultures. They're a large bird, and she just went to the bathroom for us, so. Um, they're a large bird, and again, they don't know when they're going to find their next food source. They don't have, they don't go out and hunt, they don't have a regular supply of food. So they need ways of conserving energy while they're searching far and wide for that one carcass. And so those incredibly large wings, and her wingspan is almost about six feet. Um, and some of the larger vultures even have larger wingspans, up to 10 feet or more. And it gives them that advantage that she can take off and soar, and she can be up there for hours, expend very, very little energy while she tries to find her next food source. Yes? Can they make pellets like owls? They don't make the neat kind of little clustered pellets like an owl do, but if she eats something that has a lot of hair and, and you know, skin and stuff, she'll regurgitate a little kind of pile. So not really a pellet, more so a little kind of little pile. Um, and they don't often do that because mostly they can digest almost everything they eat. But if she has, um, if it does have a lot of hair, um, she can digest a lot of bones, smaller bones that she eats like out of a rat or something. Those get digested. She doesn't need to spit those up. So she really, most things will just pass through the GI tract. So, oh yes. Now, one of the other things is, and she's not as great an example of this as some other of our local vultures, but if you see on her legs, her legs, which are pink here, her feet are a little bit whitish. You tend to see this a little bit better on our black vultures because they seem to like to do this a little bit more. But what that is, it's something called urohydrosis. And our vultures here in the Americas do this thing where they will basically defecate on their legs. Um, and what that does is that white you see is actually uric acid. So it's a deposit of some of the wastes that come out of their body. And it has a couple of different benefits for the vulture. One, it's believed to help them with thermoregulation. So it can cool them down in the summer when that evaporates and dries on their leg. And the other theory is that it's somewhat acidic when it comes out and that that helps, again, as kind of an antibacterial agent to kill things that they might be getting on their legs and feet when they're walking on carcasses. So that is called urohydrosis. Yes? Uh, a six-year-old would like to know, do they eat other vultures, dead vultures? Very good question. Um, you know, there's not a lot of documented evidence of them eating their own kind um, when they're dead. So uh, there may be cases where that happened, but it's not something we typically see. Um, they tend not to eat their own. Uh, can you also talk about regurgitation? Yes! Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. That's one of the coolest things that our vultures do. So um, our vultures, are, they're not very aggressive birds. They're actually very, very gentle and very easy to go, you know, easygoing birds. Um, but their one really unique self-defense mechanism is if they feel threatened, what they will do is projectile vomit. And so we think that has two different purposes. One, it's pretty disgusting. If you think about it, they've just consumed potentially rotting meat. Um, it's been sitting in their stomach, and then they vomit it up. So it's a good deterrent if an animal or a predator or a threat is coming to them to have them spew this kind of disgusting material at them. Um, but the other benefit is if they just gorge, because again, they don't know when they're going to get their next meal, so they will consume a lot of meat at one time. That's heavy, and they're a big bird, and it's hard to take off. So that way, if they feel threatened, they can throw up that extra weight, and they can fly it easier. But that's one of their coolest features is being able to regurge in self-defense, right? And she will do that on occasion. She doesn't do it a lot. So. Um, now just let's talk a little bit about vultures around the world. Any other questions yet uh, before I talk about their nests? Very interesting. So vultures, um, depending on the species, and there, we'll talk, there's a lot of different species around the world, 
have very different ways that they like to nest or, or have, their, have their babies. What we see here in our two vultures in Virginia, in our black vulture and our turkey vulture, they actually don't make nests. What they tend to do is find a protected spot, so they love like old abandoned barns or under decks or in little tree, kind of uh, stone caverns, a protected space that's kind of dark and, and isolated, and they lay their eggs just on the ground. So they might maybe scratch a little spot down, but they'll literally just lay their eggs on the ground, and that's, that's all they do for nesting. Some of the other vultures around the world do make nests. So some of the vultures in Africa nest in trees, some nest on cliff faces, and actually build nests. So it depends on the species. But if you encounter any breeding vultures here in Virginia, most likely you're going to find them in a barn or under a deck somewhere um, in an isolated spot. Do they have any predators? That's a great question. Um, they really don't have a lot of predators when they're adults. Um, one thing is they're just, you know, they tend, to, they're, they're a bird, so they can get away pretty easily from predators. Um, when they're young, um, they could be predated by, for instance, raccoons or other animals, um, because they'll tend to roost in nests. And like I said, they, when the babies are, are young and in a nest just under a deck, they are susceptible to being eaten by raccoons, foxes, predators like that. So as babies, yes. As adults, there's very few things that actively go after vultures. Good right now? Cool. So, as I mentioned, we have two vultures here in Virginia. Um, that's the black and the turkey vulture. In the United States, we actually have three vultures. So if you go out west, oops, sorry. Um, you go out west, you'll actually also see the California condor. And condors are a type of vulture as well. And so around the world, we have about 24 species of vultures. In the Americas, we have seven species of vultures. Some of those we don't see because they live in South America. So the closest cousin to our turkey vulture are two vultures in South America, the um, lesser and greater yellow-headed vultures. Um, one of the things that's really interesting when we look at the biology of, of vultures is that the vultures in the New World, here in the Americas, hello, and the vultures in the Old World, which would be our vultures in Africa and in Asia and in Europe, um, are not very closely related. Um, so, and, and what we call this is they both fill the same niche. They build, fill the same role in the ecosystem as, as a, a premier scavenger and a cleanup crew. But they've, they've evolved there separately. So we call that convergent evolution. Two very distantly related groups of animals that have the same form and function to fill a specific role in the environment. Did, did the question come up? Okay. Um, now, the other thing is, our vultures around the world are incredibly facing a lot of incredible challenges right now. And so of the 24 species of vultures around the world, over half of them are either endangered or critically endangered. Now, we're really lucky here in the East Coast of America because our two vulture populations, for the turkey and the black vulture, are actually strong and healthy. So we don't face a lot of the same challenges of having you know, our, all of our vultures wiped out that some other areas have. Our vultures still face challenges, as I mentioned, being shot illegally, um, facing poisoning from lead. They do have challenges. We see a lot of vultures get hit by cars on the side of the road. So they do individually face a lot of challenges, but at least our overall populations are okay. Um, why vultures, though, are facing challenges around the world, really it's interesting because it varies a lot depending on where in the world we are. So some vultures, um, and I'll speak to, um, and we start off with uh, African vultures. So part of the problem with African vultures is changing of how landscapes are used. And so when more and more land is used for agriculture and for building cities, uh, our bird populations are simply losing where they can actually live and where they can find the food that they need to survive. Um, another challenge we see is poisoning. And so we see with vultures, two different things happen. There are some inadvertent or accidental poisonings. Um, we saw this happen in India, where vultures there were consuming the dead cows and cattle in, in the country. Um, and farmers were starting to treat their older cattle with a drug called diclofenac, which is basically a, 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 a medication for, for pain and swelling. Perfectly fine for the cattle incredibly toxic for the vultures. And what happened is they lost almost 99% of all their vultures um, by the poisonings. So they didn't need to do it, it happened as an accident. More tragically though is we see deliberate poisonings. So in some places in um, Europe, some of the vultures face uh, problems where 
farmers and, and landowners will put out poison to take care of predators like you know wolves and so forth. And if a vulture finds food, they'll consume it, and they also get inadvertently poisoned by that. In Africa, we see deliberate poisoning, um, and often it's part of the um, poaching and wildlife trade. Um, so what will happen sometimes, I'm going to let Megan down to get my arm rest. There you go. Um, is a poacher knows that if they kill a uh, rhinoceros or they kill an elephant, the vultures are going to come in because there's a, new, a huge carcass, and that's going to trigger off park rangers that something's happened. So what poachers have taken to doing is they will put out poison carcasses in advance of their hunting. They will literally kill hundreds of vultures, an entire colony in one area. And as soon as the vultures are wiped out, then they will poach the elephant or the tiger or what have to lie um, because the park rangers won't be clued off. Another kind of unique challenge that the vultures can face in, in some of the African nations is also use in traditional medicine. Um, and this is something that we don't think about a lot here, but there's a traditional medicine, the muti, um, where there's a belief that vultures have some ability to see the future. And so people believe that if you kill the vulture and you consume their brain or some part of them, that it will give you the same benefit. And so many, many vultures, unfortunately, are getting killed in this basically trade for kind of a superstitious treatment of their body. Um, another big problem we see in some of the African nations is vultures um, getting electrocuted and colliding with electrical systems. So here in the US, in the US, we're pretty good about the way our power lines are set up so that our large birds like eagles and vultures don't get electrocuted. Unfortunately, in some other areas, it's not that way. And so our large vultures will land on power lines and their wings will touch and they'll be electrocuted. Um, or simply when they're flying, they're soaring and looking for food, they don't see the very tiny um, electrical lines on the distribution systems and they'll collide with it. Um, I've done some work in South Africa with vultures and a huge number of those vultures um, that come in that way end up having to stay in captivity the rest of their life because they have to have a wing amputated or a part of their wing um, removed because of the damage. How are you doing? Any questions? Uh, someone did ask how much she weighs. She weighs right now about, um, I said about 1.8 kilograms, and so that's about, I didn't even math, it's like three, about between three and four pounds. And that she's that's a pretty good weight for her. She is a full size vulture now. Um, some people do ask if she's a little bit small, but she is actually a healthy, normal sized um, female vulture. A couple more questions came in about their nesting. Yes. How many eggs do they lay, and do they make for life? Yes, okay. So typically, our, the turkey vulture and the black vulture tend to have about two, maybe three eggs with, a normal, um, with their normal nest. Um, but I would say on average, they lay two eggs and hatch out two babies. Um, yes, and they do tend to mate for life. That's one of the cool things about vultures, um, is they do pair off and tend to stay together unless one of the mates ends up being lost. The other really neat thing is, particularly for the black vulture, um, they're a very family-oriented social bird. So those pairs, when they raise their young, those babies, even when they're you know, able to fly on their own and feed themselves, will stay and be actively involved with the parents for upwards of eight or nine months. Um, so a very prolonged period, period of the parents and the young being together. Um, the vultures also tend to roost in large groups that tend to be familial groups, so large families, cousins, uh, related. Um, and so they will have those long, ongoing bonds with a lot of their um, you know, siblings. So we do see, yes, pairing for life, as well as um, prolonged parental care. The turkey vulture doesn't rape, doesn't keep their young as long. So once their babies, the turkey vulture babies, are good to go, the parents are kind of like, you're out, get, get go. Um, a little bit of difference between our two species. Can you talk about sunning? Sunning, yes. And again, I wish Vega would do her wings. She might spread her wings for me. Um, but a lot of people you see, when you're driving down the road and you see a vulture on a fence, you'll see them stand out there with their wings spread, this really beautiful pose. Um, that's, that's been termed the heraldic pose. Um, and they, there's a couple different theories for why the birds do it. Um, one is you tend to see it early in the morning before they start their daily flights. And so by being able to open their wings like that and sun themselves, they're actually basically warming up their muscles and their tissues to, to be able to fly. Um, they also think it might help with cleanliness. So if you know, ultraviolet light helps to kill bacteria and germs. And so by standing out there with your wings widespread and getting all that nice ultraviolet light, you're also helping them to kill maybe some of the bacteria that are on their wings. 
Um, and it probably just feels good. Think about when you go stand in the sun, when you stretch, and you have all that warmth, it probably just feels good to stand there with your wings spread. Can you have vultures as pets? Very good question. And the qu answer is no. And so that's something I'm glad you asked, because people sometimes see me with Vega and they're like, oh, she's so cool. I wish I could have a vulture too. Um, it, is, it is not legal to have wild animals as pets. Um, for me to actually work with Vega and use her for education, um, I had to go through a process where I had to get permits from the federal government. I had to get permits from the state. Um, she had to be a non-releasable vulture, so I would never have her if she was able to be living a normal life back in the wild. Um, but because she could not be returned, um, that is the only reason I could have permits to, to work with her and to care for her. So unfortunately, um, she couldn't go back to the wild, but I think I can give her a good quality of life when she can come out to be here. But no, nope, you can't have a vulture as a pet. Uh, is there any animal carcass they won't eat? You know, the reason that they wouldn't. So that's a that's a that's a great question. Um, in terms of, I don't think there's any specific animal, for instance, that they wouldn't eat. Um, they actually, you know, even though they eat dead things, they don't necessarily prefer rotten meat. Like I give her fresh meat every day, and she loves fresh meat. So I give her fresh venison or rats or what have you. She likes it fresh. They tend to like fresher carcasses. So there could be a point in time when it's just it's gone so far that they don't want it anymore. Um, they like it in that, honestly, that kind of window of a couple days old, you know. Um, and part of the reason the vultures will eat the raw meat is, and they need it to be, you know, dead for a day or two, is even though she has a very strong, sharp beak, she, these species of vultures, can't easily tear into the body of an animal by themselves. And so by an animal being a couple days old, it starts to break down and they can actually tear into it easier if another animal hasn't got to it first. Um, but for the most part, yeah, they'll, they'll pretty much eat most everything. And some vultures, it's interesting, most of, I mean, most of our vultures eat meat. It, occasionally vultures will eat plant matter. There's actually a specific species of vulture in Africa called a palm nut vulture, and it actually primarily eats the ripe and rotting fruit of the palm nut tree. So that was kind of a unique one. All the other vultures tend to be primarily meat eaters. Um, can you tell, tell them the difference again between turkey and uh, black vultures? And do we have more of one of those species here? So we have, so the difference between, um, I don't know the population numbers right off my head, but I, I'm gonna say we have more black vultures than turkey vultures. Um, when you see them out too, they tend, black vultures tend to congregate in larger groups. Turkey vultures tend to be a little bit more solitary. So it's not uncommon you might come across a group and there's 20 black vultures and one turkey vulture. The other kind of funny thing is that because the turkey vulture has such a good sense of smell, what will sometimes happen is the turkey vulture will soar, they will find a dead animal, they will you know, start to hone in on it. The black vultures don't smell as good. They will soar, keep an eye on where the turkey vulture goes, and then they will go down there and scare the turkey vulture off the carcass. Are you going to sleep on me here? Um, again, the other difference would be um, as adults, the turkey vulture has the red head and the white beak, and their feathers are more of a blackish brown. Um, the black vulture, you see a gray head, and actually, I forgot where this up. Let me see if I can. Which way was the turkey vultures? There. There's a good example. So if you can see, I don't know if you can see that or not. Um, but in the um, our black vulture, it's the kind of a grayish head, very jet black feathers, um, much more distinctly white on their legs. Their underside of their legs is all, is pink, but you tend to see that neurohygrosis or that that uh, uric acid on their legs. And when they soar, again, the trick to remember is the turkey vulture when they soar, it's silver on the edge of their wings, and the black vulture when you see them from underneath, the tips are white. They hang out together, these two species? They do. Um, again, they, the personality type, the black vultures tend to be a little bit more gregarious. They hang out in big groups. They're a little bit more rowdy. If you ever see them at a carcass, they tend to squabble and be a little bit more active. These birds, just by temperament, tend to be a little bit, again, quieter, a little more solitary. Um, so typically, if the black vultures are on a carcass, the turkey vulture will step aside. They're not going to compete, and they'll wait and come in afterward. In the evenings, like I mentioned, the birds will roost together, so there will be mixed flocks where black and turkey vultures will roost overnight in the same places. 
Um, but during the day, these birds will tend to be soaring in smaller groups, one, two, or three. The black vultures will be hanging out in the bigger groups. The other thing here, if you see on the table, I have some other random things. One of the important things that we do when we have an animal that's an ambassador is, you know, they're kind of, we're the focus of their life now. And so we want to make sure we're constantly keeping them engaged, keeping their minds entertained, keeping them active. So some of the things you see on the table here are different toys that I give to Vegas. So we try different toys so that she can practice picking up and manipulating objects, tearing things apart. Um, so we want to always give them things to keep them entertained. And, and vultures are very intelligent birds, very curious birds. Um, so she's constantly investigating her world and checking things out with her beak. And so some of the things I have up here are just things to keep her engaged and entertained and, and active in, in the world around her. Uh, can you introduce yourself? Oh, me again. My name is Heather Shank Evans, um, and I, again, I'm a volunteer um, in a Blue Ridge Wildlife Center doing wildlife rehab. Um, I am the caretaker of Vega. Um, my, just who I am, I also work in the field of organ and tissue donation, so I have a, another life outside of my work I do with vultures. Um, I was really lucky, um, this earlier this year, I spent two months in South Africa um, working with an organization called Volpro, um, which is one of the preeminent organizations in South Africa doing captive breeding of cave vultures, um, vulture rescue, rehabilitation. Um, so I have a really amazing opportunity to work with all the very different species of vultures we have in Southern Africa. Um, another question, uh, do you have their stats, how tall they are, wingspan, and are females bigger than males? Ah, great question. Um, like I said, her, her weight size about that, kind of 1.8 to 2 kilograms, is about kind of an average size for an adult. Height, I don't, I actually don't know off the top of my head. I mean, she's about, yeah, about that. Her wingspan's about 6 foot when she fully spreads her wings. Um, males and females, though, look alike. They don't have what we call sexual dimorphism. So the male and female don't have a huge size difference in vultures like we see in some other birds. And that's actually kind of a funny thing because we didn't really know what her gender was when she came in. We actually thought Megan was a boy for a long time. But when she became an ambassador, we actually had her blood tested um, to see what she was and found out that Vega was a female. And so we had a big gender reveal party for her and everything. And, and you can see that on um, YouTube for the uh, Blue Ridge Wildlife Center's um, page there. It was a great little bit of cake and everything. So Vega was a girl. But that's a great question because we, for a lot of birds, you can tell just by the difference in their coloring or their plumage or their size, male and females. But in our, our local vultures here, you can't tell. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much. I hope you learned some interesting and new exciting fact about vultures today. I hope that, if nothing else, you've got a little bit greater appreciation for them. Go out and spread the message of how amazing and wonderful they are. And everybody stay safe and healthy.